actually uh, a lot of, uh, of the remarks I had prepared were already dealt with, especially in yesterday's panel. So I will repeat them very quickly, and uh, I hope you'll excuse me for some improvisation. I did yesterday night to try and some flesh in my, in my presentation. So, of course, I mean, it's been said a lot of time. My view, and I think it's consistent with the consensus of the crisis, is that the main cause <coughs> is the build-up of domestic and financial imbalances. I would submit that the kind of real exchange rate appreciation that we had uh, and which showed in prime divergences in the divergences was partly an endogenous phenomenon and a reaction to strong capital fusion flows. And I will also mention very briefly that the fiscal balances that we saw were absolutely uh, small in comparison of the private sector financial balances. That private sector financial balances And if I may just make a small political remark, there are a lot of voices, especially in Europe, who say that the kind of adjustment which is asked for some countries is uh, uh, unwanted and uh, socially just austerity. Well, mm -hmm. uh, when you see that explosions in consumption, you, you just think that coming back to what would have been the normal consumption graph, if those robots had not been uh, it's socially important to bring it. But it's not, it shouldn't be seen as an illegitimate. Where did that come from? Uh, I did a study before for Professor James' presentation yesterday, and I talked about the illusion of financial integration. And actually, he had a, he had a much, much, more, much better formula, which was too much for us to find And uh, that's, what, that's exactly what it was. We interpreted, we were very uh, happy to interpret the flow of capital from north to south as a fundamental activity, as it were. Convergence, and we have a World Bank report, which is an uh, uh, issue uh, that came up to Europe, which says that the euro area is the only part of the world that capital flows in the right direction, <laughs> and, which is partly true. I mean, it's partly true, but uh, there's also that kind of phenomenon. I think we had two implicit assumptions there, and those two implicit assumptions were uh, uh, there was one big implicit assumption that cross created. Uh, cross borders, uh, the same credit risk as those. And that can be divided into two sub assumptions. The first one is that all banks are equally backed by their sovereigns, and all the sovereigns are equally uh, equally for the tail of credit risk. And then of course this assumption to be very implicit, very, very implicit, and not as much that the whole outflow will not be and nothing was nothing was done to compensate. <coughs> Thank you. 
arguments for with professors in the training that the rest of the CDC that is in France and we will not mention them right now unless you actually like briefly run I mean we owe very much to observers to show that we have the privacy of the financial institution and the fact that that's the right thing that all the financial institutions are basically now in my view that raises a quick question Target is a payment system. Uh, as much as we would like to introduce conditionality to some flows, whether the payment system should be used or not. And that brings to my second question. If you introduce friction to payments, one way or another, then you get the capital control. And uh, so this is in the idea of norms. We would uh, we would not allow for the free circulation uh, because we would not allow for the circulation of human capital. Sorry, this is a misunderstanding. Just the US system. I, I know I shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to mention something because I've been stricken during those two days that one of the big policy debates that we had inside the euro area last year was not mentioned at all. And this is uh, the so-called PSI. PSI stands for Private Sector Involvement. And this was a decision made by leaders at the end of 2010 that any rescue package which would be granted to any kind of southern countries or any kind of countries at all would come with private sector involvement, meaning that the holders of government debt would have to take a haircut one way or another. That was a very controversial decision. It was strongly opposed by the ECB and by its president, and it led to a very, very uh, vivid debate, which went at least until August or September 2011 between the ECB and, and, uh, and, and the government. Um, that's, uh, that's something you should be aware of. And you can have different views on that, uh, but I, I think I should mention that because, as a matter of fact, the introduction of PSI or the mention of PSI changed totally the game in terms of the capital markets in Europe and coincided with a strong increase in the sovereign spread, the sovereign CDS, and the bank CDS, and marked the new phase of the crisis. So you can interpret that in different ways, a moment of truth which was bound to happen, <coughs> or have a big policy-induced mistake, which I tend to think. But you should be aware that this was a major policy debate in 2011. It has major consequences. So I tried to, I tried to, to briefly mention the pros and cons of doing that. And of course, the pros are obvious. Uh, having, it's removing that illusion that all sovereigns are equal, that uh, they are also. Uh, that, that there would be a bailout, and it, it, it removes the, impl the implicit bailout assumptions, which by itself is good. It eliminates moral hazard, and it's supposed to establish uh, market decisions. 
the cost, of course, are extremely important. And uh, uh, those costs are <laughs> sometimes not palatable to economists because economists tend to think that once you have a default risk, you should be pricing the market normally. And the way I would rationalize that personally is that when there is uncertainty on the sustainability of the debt, the question of the willingness to pay is extremely important. And whether the sovereigns show willingness to pay or not a willingness to pay, and again, we've learned that from the emerging market crisis of the last decade, will determine on which equilibrium uh, the market focus in terms of, of credit spread. And what the BSI did, in my view, is signal that there might not be a full willingness to pay by some sovereign in the EU area. And that was the first time in 50 years for what are called OECD countries advancing them. And that was, in my view, a major regime change. So that triggered a, a several series of spiral, which we are dealing still now, a spiral between some fancy of liquidity and sovereign. Uh, since I'm going to show a graph in a minute, the sovereign spread are the floor on the, on, the, on the funding cost of the banks themselves, so it triggered the deterioration of the funding condition of the bank. And so we, we had several spiral, several feedback loops interacting together between the sovereign and the banks between the banks and the sovereign, and between the sovereigns themselves, liquidity and solvency. And the whole policy debate today is at which point of the spiral you should apply pressure to, uh, to stop it. And most of us, some of us would say, you should strengthen the bank capital. Benoit alluded to that, and that will stop the spiral at the bank level. What the ECB has done is to stop the spiral at the founding level, with it here at zero. Again, it's a matter of policy judgment where you put the pressure, but there's no doubt in my view that part of the spiral was created by this decision to go through PSI, which again, I think the ECB <coughs> strongly opposed. It's fast, but it's very important. So you see here that the spreads widened uh, uh, significantly after, after the decision. The decision, in fact, goes back to Dovi by the end of 2010. You see here that the, the cost of funding of the banks are very much related to the sovereign CDS spread. So this is a line which, sees that which shows the, the change in sovereign CDS spread uh, together with the change in bank and funding spread, uh, the bank CDS spread. And you see that uh, very much the sovereign acts as a, uh, which means that we don't have a European banking system, we have several national banking system. You see the bank credit spread jumping <laughs> incredibly in Europe. Uh, just after Tobi. <laughs> this, is, this is very spectacular in my view. And there's no objective reason to that because you see that uh, that comes from the BIS. You know, you see that the capital situation as assessed by the BIS from European banks was not that divergent from the, from the, from the other. Areas. So something happened to create that credit spread in the banking system. My view, again, it's personal, is that this was the unfortunate PSI decision. So what should be done now? Uh, Benoit mentioned a lot of it, and the other mentioned of it. We should have, I mean, the big question when you're in a crisis and you're building Europe, and the big question with what Europe has been dealing with over the last 30 years, what should we do at the federal level? What should we do at the national level? And one thing that the <coughs> crisis has made clear that we should do at the federal level is banking supervision, banking resolution, banking macro supervision. We should have a very, very strong federal power to regulate those banks which have a cross-border, all, all those international institutions which have a cross-border uh, activity. And that, if we had that, uh, if we had that authority in front of would have said, would have been in a political position to put a stop in the, in, in the real estate bubble in Spain, to put a stop in some bubbles in other countries. So that's what we need. If we want to have financial aggression, we need to have the regulatory, supervisory, and financial resolution from and financial infrastructure to support it. And one of the worries I have now is that the, the, the debate on what should go on the federal is artificially put on the fiscal policies, which is not the main issue. The main issue is to have financial policy, financial regulatory policy, which are commensurate at the federal level with the kind of financial integration that we have reached. That's very important. Then we have the question, of course, we had a unified market, bond market, and we were, uh, in, I would say on the verge, of providing something for investors in terms of stores of value, which was equivalent <coughs> in growth and liquidity to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, I'm finished? 
<laughs> but I have other things to say, so I... <laughs> One or two minutes. Two minutes, okay. So, new stores are value, we come back to that, but there's a good way of getting that is through financial innovation rather than, uh, than uh, going if you implicitly still transfer. Next, I would like to finish by the question which, uh, which, which uh, Professor James asked us today. Is the euro a new gold standard? The first thing I should say, it hasn't been said, there is no institution of control to the gold standard. Uh, the, the ECB can issue as much base money as they want, and that's, the, that's what they've been doing. And that's what they've been doing for two years. I mean, everybody's focused on the VLTO over December, but the real shift occurred in October 2008 when they moved to uh, what they call the full allotment fixed rate policy, meaning that they would allocate liquidity on unlimited amount at the policy rate. But so what the VLTO has been doing is basically lengthening the maturity of those operations. But there has been unlimited creation of this money in the in the euro area. So that's a big difference from the gold standard in using hand. But there's no fiscal backing. And that's, uh, as Professor Sims has shown yesterday, put a, a, a theoretical cap on the amount of base money. And unless you have sufficient capital to substitute it. So the question of the capital of the legal system, uh, I think uh, Ricardo yesterday said it was relevant. I think it's very relevant. Because precisely the big difference between if you take the Fed, the Bank of England on the one side, and the ECB on the other side, and that, that fiscal backing in the sense of Professor Sims <coughs> is present in those countries. So that uh, in case the central bank network goes negative, you still have the fiscal backing capacity which allows you to redeem the base money uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in good in normal circumstances. Whereas in the ECB, you don't have that. You don't have, you have 17 treasuries and you don't have the fiscal backing. That's why you need the capital. The capital is extremely important and it is there. Uh, it is difficult to detect it. And Ricardo was right. The accounting is very, very special and very obscure. But it is there. And so I'll end up with this very sort of clear uh, which I'm providing this to the night. Uh, you, you, you can think of about four situations. Uh, first, I look at the consolidated government within the central bank and I look at its solvency in terms of uh, basically the discounted amount of uh, primary surplus in all the bigger than the, the, the real value of the monetary base plus the real value of the outstanding bond uh, issue. And the central bank solvency, defined as defined by the professor, uh, by professor Singh, as I understand it, this is the amount of capital that you would need to be able to redeem all base money uh, and cover the losses on, 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 on this redemption. Finished? <laughs> But if you look, if you look at the four, uh, if you look at the four, uh, the four square here, the interesting thing is that the ECB is on the left hand side, down there, uh, and that's where that's what that's where they need capital uh, instead of the other. The four other the four other squares are, are self-explanatory. Thank you very much.